it was very kind uh, of Lev to uh, invite me to come to Montreal uh, and uh, uh, to experience uh, the different kind of French again. I, I love the city, so I, I really, really enjoy being here all the time. Uh, and uh, this time, uh, it was a really interesting question. So what would you like that we all should forget? So uh, what kind of like broken dream, so to speak, because my new film is the glossary of broken dreams. So what broken dream should we forget? What is there out there that should be undone in a certain way or maybe thought again or be re-evaluated? And uh, there is one thing that I've been dealing with uh, pretty much like all my life and there are many people out there I would like to forget. And uh, I just like, <laughs> I made a couple of notes here in my, it's, it's not the Quran. All the people ask me, do you have a Quran? No, it's not the Quran, it's just my, it's my notebook, okay, yeah. So, for example, Edward Snowden, or J.G. Ballard, or Jello Biafra, or Robert Crumb, or the Survival Research Labs, or Banksy, or Burning Man, or The Yes Man, or Janis Joplin, or Timothy Leary, or Frank Zappa, or Donna Haraway, or KLF, or Marilyn Manson, and many, many, many other people. Uh, what are they? What do you think are they? They are all members of one strange concept that I want to obliterate, and it's counterculture. How I hate it. <laughs> counterculture. Subversion. Uh, let's deal with it. Uh, I'm not sure I can really eradicate it, but I can tell you why I hate it. And of course, it's a love-hate relationship. I grew up in it. I grew up with it. And uh, the story is that um, I grew up in Austria uh, in a small little town in the countryside called Stockerau. Uh, I was born in 1975. That makes me old. Uh, it also makes me as uh, one of those people out there who went through all the different digital revolutions you could actually have. Uh, I was online in 1988 before even the World Wide Web existed, so that makes me really old. I was 13 years old, so I was a small little boy in a small little town in Austria, uh, and there were no other people out there who were like me. I was a classic nerd. There was not a term for that back then, especially not in Austria. But uh, I felt I was different. And I especially felt that because people were beating me up in school <laughs> because I was different. So I was in a strange way part of this privileged subculture called nerddom. That means my parents had money. They bought me a computer. I could go online. And I could have friends online because I didn't have other real friends who were interested in the same stuff that I was interested in. So what happened was is I was communicating with people from all over the planet, most of them, of course, male, most of them over 40 years old, which makes it a little bit creepy. Uh, but um, I was talking to them, and they kind of understood me, and I understood them, and it was really, really interesting. So I remember, I really have to tell that story right now, is I downloaded my first porn image when I was 13 years old. It took six hours. <laughs> Uh, it was a long distance connection from Austria to Germany. I think it was probably a thousand dollars worth of porn image. Uh, and I already came with the first two lines downloaded. I couldn't even see anything. It was just like so charged with like, I will see porn. It, it, was, it was done. Uh, I still have that image. I, I cherish it. Uh, uh, well, anyhow, so. Uh, what, what I want to tell with this story is I was different. <laughs> I still am different. And of course, if you're different, if you are a nerd, if you are somehow part of a society that doesn't really like you or you're different, you try to cope with it. There is a certain obsession, of course. There's a certain trauma, and you deal with it. And uh, I dealt with it that over time I was really interested in, you know, like cyberpunk literature and neuromancer and Robocop. I still think that Robocop is one of the most important films ever made. And one of, I really, not ironic, really, I think that it is a really, really good film. And if you see Robocop from 1987 nowadays, everything came true in Robocop besides Robocop. Not the Robocop, but everything else is true, like Detroit is bankrupt and everything, yeah? Uh, it, it's a great film. But so what happened is that I, I read a lot of science fiction 
And science fiction, of course, is a very political genre. You read it and it tells you something about the present uh, because you never can write about the future. There is no future. There's not even a past. There's just the present. Uh, but at least you can try to reflect on what's going on. And uh, one part of counterculture, one part of subculture, one part of political culture is always reflecting of what's wrong and how we can change it. And uh, I became a real actual punk because I read cyberpunk, because I didn't want that future to happen. So I joined the anti-fascist movement in, in Austria. And at one point, I wanted to do a fanzine, a magazine called Monochrome, and I started that. Uh, and uh, a couple of my friends uh, joined that I found online. And uh, so what happened was that I wanted to spread information. I wanted to get a message across. The main problem with subculture is that only people who are interested in subculture consume subculture. Uh, because nobody who doesn't know about the specific codes, someone in the early 1990s who didn't know what a fanzine is, wouldn't buy a fanzine or, or, or find a way to get his or her hands on a fanzine. So it was always a certain way of preaching to the converted. And uh, I kind of realized that over time and thought like, yeah, maybe I have to find different mediums, uh, different media uh, to spread the message. So, so what's the perfect weapon of mass distribution, so to speak, of an idea? And maybe sometimes it's a theater play, and maybe a short film, or maybe a performance, or sitting here on stage, whatever it is. So Monochrome, my art tech collective, uh, was always interested in that strange problem that nobody wants to listen, but you somehow have to make them listen. So how can you do that? What kind of emotional machine do you create to make them listen to you? And that's kind of hard. So, and of course I grew up telling you all that stuff about fanzines and uh, being online in 1988 and all that stuff. Of course, I was always in a certain way part of counterculture. I had, like, I was a huge fan of the survival research labs and v and, and the research publications and, and all that stuff. And of course, Frank Zappa, you, yeah, you name it, yeah? Uh, but the problem with, with uh, subculture or counterculture is that it's actually, it's a, it's, it's a wrong direction. And I have to jump back a little bit to elaborate on that. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s, 1960s, maybe 1970s, uh, in the 1960s, the hippie culture had a much broader political uh, spectrum or, or vision. Uh, the hippie culture actually wanted to change society as a whole. And that didn't work, uh, so they all kind of like retracted and, and they were like little, like, like turtles. They just like, they stuck out their, their, their little head and pulled it back immediately after a couple of years of seeing that it doesn't work. So what happened is that hippie culture wanted to change the planet. It didn't work. So the next countercultural movement that started that was important uh, was the punk movement. And the punk movement was, so to speak, uh, if the hippies were the, uh, uh, the, old, uh, the old sisters and old brothers. Uh, uh, the, the punk movement were the younger sisters and the younger brothers. So they were in a certain way already attacking uh, their sisters and brothers because they were uncool and unhip and they were just like hippies. So the punks in a certain way wanted to, to become the next thing. And the cool thing about the punk movement was that it was the first do-it-yourself revolution uh, as far as I can tell. Because Back then, uh, specifically the parents of the punks had uh, you know, super eight, uh, eight millimeter cameras or they had Polaroid uh, cameras or they had maybe early video taping systems or they had all kinds of consumer electronics that the parents bought but never used just for you know, like birthday parties or, or, or Christmas or something like that. So the punks took that media technology and used an app used it in an interesting way and did stuff with it. They made music videos or, or, or films or, or they played uh, music, although they couldn't really play music. So they were very hardcore, do it yourself, just like, fuck, we'll, we'll just do it. And that, of course, you can see that still, like in an aesthetic way, the punk revolution was, was one of the most important things that happened to popular aesthetics, I think, in the 20th century. So. 
why do I still don't like it? Why, why am I so hating on, 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 on subculture and, and counterculture? I think the main problem is, is that at one point, uh, something like alternative culture gave up on the notion of that we can actually change society. Uh, it got in a certain way subsumed and assimilated by the classic uh, capitalist society around it. They were trying to find niches in society. They were creating something like, you know, like anti-authoritarian kindergartens, or they were creating something like a squat, or they were creating something uh, uh, like nowadays very popular, something like a hackerspace or makerspace. All that stuff has uh, a clear historical tradition going back uh, to the 1950s and 1960s and the first uh, countercultural movements. But the countercultural cultural movements kind of like gave up on the idea and the notion of like, we should change society as a whole. They kind of gave up. Uh, why did they give up? Uh, because honestly, it's quite hard to attack the normative uh, power of capitalism. But in a certain way, strangely nowadays, it is far more likely that people would believe you if I tell them that the world will end in 25 years and everything will go down the drain and will run out of oil and everything is fucked and, and we'll have the apocalypse in 25 years. People would rather believe that than that we could end capitalism. There is, it's just like not even possible to think about the general notion that there might be something beyond what we call capitalism. And capitalism is not very old. I mean, we speak of something that is 250 years old. Uh, something like the notion of Western privacy is only 250 years old. It doesn't even exist in that precise way, for example, in, in, in Asian cultures. So what happened is, is that 250 years ago, a thing called capitalism became suddenly, uh, because a couple of historical things just like came together, like uh, the end of metaphysics and the beginning of science, or what we call science, the, uh, the beginning of what we now call art, and all that stuff like, comes together at one specific point in human history, and that was like, roughly 200, 250 years ago, and created this strange and totalitarian system that we now call capitalism, that is pretty much like the, the economic doctrine that is running the planet. So how can we bypass that? Of course, it's kind of hard. But in a certain way, there are, of course, movements within that. And uh, we can use that, and we can try to hack our way in it. But at the same time, we have to tell ourselves, like, we actually want to do that. We are not reformists. We are not giving up on the basic idea that we can change society. And I think that counterculture gave up on that. Counterculture is very fine with where they are. And countercultures, of course, are predominantly male. They are predominantly white. Uh, most of the time, and they are quite nice in their little niches, and they are quite nice in their little, uh, you know, like Wikipedia subgroups that only discuss like metal music from Norway or whatever it is. Yeah, so it became kind of like um, uh, an interesting. I'm against it pastime, and I don't like that. Uh, so if we go to the 1960s, in the 1960s. Uh, there was, for example, in Austria, I'm from Austria, I grew up a good old Catholic, that's why I enjoy masturbation, I guess. Uh, uh, because, you know, like Catholics, they just like, they, they can't deal with it. They need the specific, yeah, whatever, kink, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, mother, I'm, I'm sorry, mother, yeah, I, I, you don't want to hear that. Um, so in the 1960s, Austria was a very Catholic country, uh, still is a Catholic country, but uh, 50s and 60s, it was, of course, very horrible. I mean. Most of the Nazis were still Nazis. They were never, like in Germany, for example, in Germany they did a way better job of kicking out the Nazis or actually throwing them to jail and stuff like that. In Austria, it was always like, you know, like between 1938 and 1945, Austria didn't exist, so we don't have a problem. Uh, hmm. uh, so in the 50s and 60s, uh, radical artists uh, uh, called the Viennese actionists, for example, they did quite interesting stuff. They did very provocative art. They were painting with blood or similar things. They were quite out there. They, they challenged society uh, because society was very conservative. Society was something uh, that you could easily tickle uh, because uh, it kind of wanted to be tickled. So if you would paint with blood, uh, then of course some newspaper 
would write an article about it and say like, you can't do this, you know, don't, blah, blah, horrible, horrible, they should go to jail, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and of course, that was what they wanted. They wanted to challenge society, that's why they did it, and society reacted to it. Uh, because it was also in the best interest of the newspapers and all that stuff, so that was kind of like the game that was going on, yeah? Uh, for example, like someone like Günther Bruce, for example, a Viennese actionist, he was walking on the street with a white suit, white face, um, red, kind of like blood drippings on, on his uh, uh, suit. And he went to jail for like two or three weeks for doing that. I mean, nowadays, you can be happy if some tourist takes a picture of it and three people like it on Facebook, you know? So what happened between 1965, Quinto Bruce going to jail, and nowadays when there's just like nobody giving a shit about that stuff anymore? Uh, and what happened is that there is a, 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 a change is going on. And that change, uh, and Foucault uh, calls it the shift from a so-called disciplinary society towards a society of control. Of course, that is all within the realm of capitalism, of course, but uh, it's quite interesting to, to take that uh, notion or to take that concept and explore it a little bit further. So a disciplinary society as a society that is quite clearly structured. There are clear hierarchies in that society. There is a king or a president, like Trump or whoever, or what, what's your guy's name? The, the liberal guy? Oh, yeah. he's, he's so nice. He's, he's always nice on, on YouTube. Yeah, I like him. So uh, anyhow, he's the president. He's up there. He, it's a classic hierarchical structure in any company, like the, the, the classic um, capitalist of the 19th century is on top of that pyramid and then there are workers beneath uh, him, and uh, the workers, of course, hate the boss, so there's an antagonism going on between the workers who hate the boss and the boss who wants to exploit the workers. That's quite easily structured, yeah? And the cool thing about that is that it has an embedded moment of subversion in it, because as long as you know how the structure of society works, as long as you know that you can prank your teacher or you can disobey the police officer or whoever, as long as you can do that, there is still a way out. So there is subversion embedded into the disciplinary society. For example, my dad, uh, he was always going to the bathroom at his job 25 minutes every day. He couldn't go into the bathroom with a newspaper because they would say you can't read in the bathroom for such a long time. But he was just like going there for 25 minutes, uh, sitting there, because that was fun for him because he was actually stealing time from his boss. He hated his boss so much, he would rather sit 25 minutes on his ass in the bathroom than work, you know? That's a classic worker-boss antagonism, how I like it, yeah? <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, the same, for example, is true, like, talking about masturbation and all that stuff. Like, if there is a god up there, and this god tells you, you should not masturbate because you will go to hell if you do it, that's a very classic disciplinary society, you know? Even the beyond is telling you what to do, okay? Uh, and it's quite clear what it wants, that beyond. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, hierarchical societies work like this, and that's why the Viennese actionists could quite easily attack that structure. Because the police would just like say, like, you can't do that, society doesn't like this, I'll send you to jail for your crappy piece of art, okay? Uh, and it would happen. But nowadays, we are more and more living in a society of control. And a society of control is a society where the hierarchies are not as clear anymore. The hierarchies still exist. There is still something like uh, a boss. But the boss nowadays is your friend. The boss is not like the evil guy who makes you create a union to fight him. No, the boss is the guy that embraces you. The boss is the guy who actually likes you. The boss is the guy who asks you, hey, can you actually stay in on the weekend and help me? It would be really great. I can't, tell, I can't pay you a lot for it, but it would be really nice. And you say, yes, of course, I'll do that, sure. And that's the way exploitation works nowadays, because the boss is still your boss. The boss can still fire you, but the boss is friendly to you, and that makes it really hard to hate him, okay? That is the society of control, yeah? The society of control makes you want to enjoy your oppression. Uh, and um, 
That is really fucked up. Because in that moment, there is no subversion anymore. Uh, an example for uh, so when I, so we're talking about Catholicism post-1968, so post-Second Vaticanum, okay? So when I went to uh, Bible school when I was a kid, uh, they didn't tell me that I shouldn't masturbate anymore. They told me, you can actually masturbate, it's, it's fine, but please be considerate about it. And like the moment you want to masturbate and be considerate about it, it, it's all off. It's like, it's just like it, it, it. no. <laughs> and that's how they get you. That's a classic move of a society of control. They get into your head and fuck with it, and suddenly you could actually masturbate, but suddenly you just, uh, uh, wrong, wrong. <laughs> um, so, and, and there are many examples for that, yeah? So, another example is like in the 1960s, the Viennese actionists did really, really gruesome things and painting with blood and stuff like that, yeah? But they, of course, they somehow became part of art history, but they never got very rich with it. But just like, you know, 20 years ago, there were a couple of people called uh, jackass, and they're millionaires in the meantime. And they pretty much like did all the stuff that the Viennese actionists did just on MTV and became millionaires with it. So in the meantime, society wants us to subvert. Society wants us to be edgy. Society wants us to not be the person with the tie uh, in our little job interview. It wants us the person uh, to be the person with the strange Linux uh, and like a joke on, on your t-shirt going into the door there. It wants us to be uh, kind of like out there. Uh, but at the same time, it only wants it to a certain degree but most of the subcultures out there are not going that far. They're, they're kind of like the uh, exploitation uh, is uh, in a certain way accepted, of course, only to a certain degree, but, but that level of degree or, or, or resisting the system almost never happens because suddenly there is something jumping in like the, the, we can't do that, that would involve violence, or that would involve something that is really, we can't do. So there's this strange balance in our head that lets us know what kind of subversion is okay and what some kind of subversion is not okay anymore. And uh, that's tricky. So how do you deal with this? You cannot subvert yourself, so because the very moment you think that something is good for you, you don't want to change this. So how can you actually deal with this? How can you say, I want a better future for me and the planet, uh, but I want to do it in a way <laughs> that is not really actually helping it. Because the main problem is like, you probably remember Naomi Klein, whatever happened to Naomi Klein, I don't know, but she had a bestseller called No Logo, yeah? Many, many years ago. And the first people who read No Logo, the first people who uh, read her critique about branding and how Nike and all that stuff works and how uh, like global corporations work and how sweatshops are formed and all that stuff. The first people to read this book were the people who were creating ad strategies. It were like content strategy guys, ad strategy guys. It were people like uh, uh, companies working for Nike and doing their uh, 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 advertising uh, projects. For them, I like in the meantime, Nike is hiring people who do uh, graffiti uh, spraying for them. They do graffiti advertising uh, jobs for Nike. And the strange thing is, like there are many graffiti artists out there who still get arrested because they can't afford the fines because they are doing street work. Uh, but of course, the street uh, the street artists who work for Nike they can do whatever they want because Nike will just like pay all the fines. They can just afford it. And this is just like a weird, weird thing going on out there. So, well, um, I'm sitting here because honestly, I have no clue how we can stop this. Uh, but, but, hmm, maybe you can help me with that. I don't know. So, what I think is that uh, the society of control is only effective the moment that you don't realize that it exists. So I think 
as a kind of classic Marxist, I have to say, uh, of course, you never say that because people will hate you for that. But maybe, maybe hate is also a good reaction. There's only love and hate and, and boredom, I guess. And boredom is the most important of all emotions. Uh, so uh, as a classic Marxist, I would say the only way to form critique or to change something is to be aware what is going on. That's why Marx was so important in the 19th century, because he formulated a valid critique of the economical system that was going on, that is still going on. But by understanding it, by kind of like writing it down, by pointing it out, by saying, like, this is how it works, uh, you can actually stop um, believing in it. It's, it's breaking the curse, so to speak. Uh, one of the curses that I broke for myself is I was really, really uh, avid player of uh, Ingress. I'm not sure. Do you know Ingress? It's a, a, a massive multiplayer augmented reality uh, a game that you play on your cell phone. And I actually really liked it. And Ingress is, um, uh, is by Google. It's a, it's a Google product. And it works in a way that there are two different uh, parties in the game. You're actually part of the blue team or the green team. And if you're part of the blue team, you attack the green team. If you're part of the green team, you attack the blue team. And you do that on your, uh, on your cell phone. So you walk around in the city and see, oh, there's the CCA. The CCA is blue. But I'm the green guy. So I get other green guys, and then we together attack the CCA and turn it from blue into green. So the whole game is based on the notion of geotagging. So some blue guy at one point went to the CCA, entered the CCA in ingress, uh, tagged it, so to speak, in the system, and turned it blue. So the structure suddenly was blue. And then other people see, ah, there's a blue structure, the CCA. We want to turn it green, and then people try to attack it. So the basic idea is you claim ownership of buildings on the planet, and then you try to turn it if the ownership is on the other side of, of, of the team. Uh, what happens is that millions and millions of people on the planet run around with their smartphones and geotag buildings and geotag statues and geotag bridges or ferries or whatever it is. Uh, and by that, they are entering physical data, geodata, that Google uses and sells. And they're doing it for free for Google. They are working for Google. Google could never pay so many people to do the shitty job of walking around in a city and geotagging buildings. But suddenly, there are millions of people out there, just because of the stupid gamification that they came up with in Ingress, who are just like happy about that. They are happy that they can walk around and geotag things. And they like it a lot. And I was one of those guys. I was like, just like, oh, I like that. What? Pokemon Go, same thing, also is a subdivision of, of Google, by the way. Uh, and when I realized what's really going on, I was like, fuck. Mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm, 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 not, I'm not working for Google for free. They can pay me. They can pay my ass, but I'm not doing that for free. Yeah? But I mean, the very moment you realize what's going on, something, something changes in you, of course. Uh, of course, you can do that with all different kinds of systems. You can say, like, do I want to be part of Facebook or not? Do I want to be part of Twitter or not? Uh, it just depends on what kind of tactics you want to see. For example, I like being on Facebook because Facebook is just an like, interesting artistic playground for me. I have like between 15 and 16 fake accounts on Facebook. One of them is a 12-year-old uh, white Aryan supremacist from Montana that I'm playing. Nobody, not even my wife, knows who that character is because I don't want them contaminated. But in a certain way, I'm trying to play with the structure. I'm trying to find out how it works and to analyze it. Because only if you know how something works and you know how to analyze it, you can probably find a way to use it in a certain way. Because I'm not a technophile. I'm not saying, like, uh, you shouldn't use Facebook because, or you shouldn't use this because, or you shouldn't use this because. I want to understand what the basic mechanism behind it is, and then I can still decide if I want to uh, use it in, uh, uh, in some way that I find fit or not. Uh, OK, uh, going back to counterculture. So counterculture uh, has the inherent problem that it does not want to actually be part of society. So that what I kind of like started with my opening statement was that I think that counterculture is something that is pretty happy about where they are. 
and I kind of want to get them back from there. I want to I want to find a way uh, to 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 kind of like bring some kind of like meaningful uh, in interaction in this. Uh, I want to be different than other people. I want that people are different, but I want them to be different because of a certain motivation, not just because like, I like metal, you like techno, I don't like you. That's all kind of like, like so the very moment that counterculture is just a lifestyle, uh, it is completely devoid of meaning. So, so the interesting part of counterculture is the counter, yeah? And I'm not talking about the sales counter. There's this really, really interesting uh, uh, cartoon from the 1960s where a classic hippie guy is, uh, hand, uh, is, is, is uh, handing over uh, an LP to a guy behind the counter, uh, uh, like who is nicely cleaned up and obviously part of like an LP, uh, LP store or like a record store of some kind. Yeah, so the, the hippie guy is actually buying a record in that store, yeah, uh, and 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 the title of that cartoon was counterculture. It's, it's the, the, or the over-the-counter culture, whatever how you call it. Like, that's not what I want. And the problem is that all counterculture, in the meantime, in some way turned into an over-the-counter culture. Yeah? Uh, and uh, of course, you go and check out how many squats are in your town. Of course, squatting is also a certain form of, of being against something. It's, it's uh, not obeying uh, the rules of pr property, for example, or it's like learning things in a do-it-yourself way to kind of like put you know, like pipes into a building that doesn't have pipes or something like that. Yeah? But of course, there's a difference between if you're a skater boy or if you're squatting somewhere, because the basic difference is, is that squatting is directly attacking a certain part of our culture that is enormously important. And it's the culture, uh, and it's the basic notion of, 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 of private property. So private property is at the very core of what we now call uh, capitalism. Uh, it, in many cases, it didn't exist before that. I mean, under Henry VIII alone, there were 72,000 people just a couple of hundred years ago. 70, 72,000 people were executed for vagabondage just because they, uh, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't use their land anymore because there was, there were, the land was commons. They could just like harvest and plant things on land that didn't belong to anyone, and they lived off that. They were just like self-sufficient peasants because they had common ground. Uh, and the common ground was uh, destroyed by, by early capitalist movements in the 1700s and stuff like that. So the, the, the peasants didn't know what to do, so they had to go to the cities and work in factories. And if they didn't go to the cities and work in factories, they were vagabonding, and that was a criminal offense, and they were actually executed if they found you, just like wandering around on the street uh, in England at that time. So, I mean, capitalism is nothing that started because of human nature. It started because of organized violence, hardcore violence, yeah? <laughs> and we cannot forget that. And one part of that organized violence is the violence of private property. Yeah? And for example, uh, squatting is directly attacking that. Of course you could say like, yeah, well, squatting is also kind of like, it's kind of like a couple of young people, they have nothing better to do. They want to like, uh, give the finger to their parents. They sleep somewhere in buildings that don't belong to them, blah, 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 blah. Of course, yeah. But I mean, there's a certain difference in the, in the, in the gesture, let's say it. Of course, uh, in, in, in a world that is, that is uh, full of gestures, there are different gestures and there are different um, uh, expressions that you can get out of or, or that, that, you, that, you, that you can evoke by, by doing something. And I'm not saying like we'll change the world by just like old starting to squat or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but I think that uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, there, there are certain hierarchies or certain lines, like, uh, like glass ceilings or invisible lines, even in a, in a society where the hierarchies and hierarchies are getting uh, more narrow and more narrow and more narrow, that we can actually start to, 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 to break or to actually focus on making the hierarchies more clear to make people hate them. Uh, in a certain way. Um, 
maybe that's a way to say it. So I see that I have like another, another 10 or 15 minutes and uh, I would like to tell you a story that is in certain ways um, related to the conundrum that I, I, I'm trying to present you here. Because of course, uh, I'm an artist, uh, I have to live, you know, I have to buy food, stuff like that. Of course, I cannot just like uh, start farming. I don't own farmland. So, uh, so uh, I probably could, I would be a really good farmer. I would be a really good farmer. Would you, would you say mom? I'm a really good farmer. Uh, and uh, my mom likes me. She, she thinks that I can do everything that I want in my life. Yeah. Uh, and so what can you do to make a difference? What, what, what can you... What can you do? And there's, there's one story I'd like to tell you uh, that happened in 2002 and 2003. And uh, so we were sitting around in our little space uh, in Vienna, Austria. And uh, I have to say that the art world was not really interested in us back then. I'm not even sure that I really like the term art. Art is a special place for special people in in a really bad font, I think, yeah. Uh, so, art has this like strange elitist notion to it. And uh, uh, of course that's also related to what we now call art and how that emerged through capitalism. But we were sitting there and uh, what was on our mind was that back then there was a massive shift in Austria in political terms uh, because for the first time in Austrian history after the Second World War, uh, the Conservative Party teamed up with the so-called Freedom Party. And you can imagine what the Freedom Party is, it's the neo-fascists. Um, and uh, under Jörg Haider, I'm not sure if Jörg Haider is still, still uh, uh, known to you, but he was the head of the of the super right-wing populist Freedom Party back then. So for the first time ever, the conservatives did not team up with the social democrats, but with the, the right-wing populists. And we were on the street demonstrating against that because we, of course, really hated that. There, were, there was a kind of form of civil unrest uh, in Austria because for the first time ever, there was something going on that people didn't like and people went on the street and demonstrated. And it was really, really interesting to see that. But in that time, we got a phone call by a curator, and she told us that she would like to invite us at Monochrome as the official Austrian representatives at the Biennial in Sao Paulo. So the Biennial in Sao Paulo is the third largest biennial on the planet, and it was really, really kind of crazy that she would invite us to be the Austrian national representatives to go to the Biennial. But we told her we can't do that. I mean, we are on the street demonstrating against the Austrian government and then we should represent Austria and the government at the biennial. No, we can't do that. I'm sorry. No. And then she told us how much money we would get. And we said, like, how much money? And she said, like, yeah. And we said, yeah. And we said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we did it. Uh, of course, because we were not stupid. Uh, uh, so we did it because we needed to live. We were young and needed the money. Uh, and uh, so what happened is that we told her, we only want to do this if we have full control over the press releases and everything. So whatever goes to the press, whatever we are doing, we want to have full control over it. And she said, that's fine. Let's do it. OK. And, uh, and we were happy about that. So we decided we didn't want to go ourselves. We wanted to send someone else there. So we picked another artist to go for us to the Biennial. So we kind of like subcontracted the whole thing. And we wrote the press release. The, the guy's name was Georg Paul Thoman. He was um, older back then already. Uh, he was also part of the Viennese Actionists and other art movements. So he was a um, really interesting uh, character, kind of like an asshole, but um, we liked him. So we sent him uh, to the Biennial. We sent out the press release. All the Austrian newspapers reported about it. Uh, which was very funny because the guy didn't exist. We made him up. He was a complete fake. The basic idea of the project was we wanted to send out the press release about this non-existing artist and we wanted to write a 500-page biography about his life and times with all our hate about art and culture and whatever in this tome of a biography about this non-existing artist uh, and only send the book to the biennial and that would be our, our piece of art. And, uh, but now we had the problem uh, that suddenly people 
thought that the guy really exists. So there were all the newspapers and, and magazines were writing about Georg Paul Thoman. None of the journalists actually did a Google search. There was not a single entry on Google about this guy. Eh? But everyone wrote about him, and suddenly he existed. Out of nothing, he became into uh, a human, strange human being. Uh, so what we thought now is like, OK, uh, we should go and put the context hack, so to speak, a little bit further and say, like, OK, if people now really think that the guy exists, we should actually go to the biennial ourselves and see what we can do there. So we went to the biennial. We set up a piece of art for him. It was really bad, kind of like 1980s. It was called Self-Portrait as the Großglockner, Austria's highest mountain. It was really bad, like <laughs> shitty piece of art, really, like, uh, like blurry paintings of mountainsides. And there was, there was his face on a, on a Windows button over it. And it's like really bad, yeah? So we were there setting it up. People came in and looking at the piece of art and seeing like, oh, that's really bad. And we said like, uh, yeah, whatever. And other guys came in like, what, what is this? Can, wow. Can, can I talk to the, to the artist? And we said like, yeah, he's in the hotel room probably wanking or something. I don't know. We don't know because we are actually the technical support team. So we, we, we don't know anything about the piece of art. We get a really... Sh shitty salary for setting it up here. If you have any questions uh, to the artist, call the number. Here's his hotel room. We don't give a shit. And people called his hotel room. We had a hotel room for him. Uh, but of course, he never went to the phone. He had this like really nice, uh, it was the time when you still had answering machines. And we had these answering machines. It was really nice. So we were there, and we were really, really uh, lonely because Nobody wanted to talk to us because we were just like the stupid technical support team. The technical support team is the lowest level of what you can be at a biennial. Nobody talks to you. Nobody. Nobody gives you their precious business cards and wants to talk to you about an exhibition in New York or something like that. No, 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 no. You're just like, you sit in the corner, you drink beer, you eat a sausage, and you are lonely. You're only lonely as long as you don't talk to the other technical support teams who are immediately your friends because they're also lonely. So all the technical support teams know each other and talk to each other and are kind of like cool guys. And so that's what we did. So we were suddenly with all the other technical support guys. And after a week or two setting up and being there, we felt bad that we were actually lying to our friends, that, they, that we were pretending that we were technical support teams and that we're interested in football and stuff like that. And so we told them, hey, actually, I want to, we feel bad about that, but we are actually artists, and the guy who did the bad art, he doesn't really exist, and we made him up because, and we told them the story. Yeah? And they were really happy that we told them, and they said, like, wow, that's funny. We have never heard something like that. That's cool. Uh, so what, what do we do with this information? And we said, like, whatever you want. I'm, whatever you want. And suddenly, the technical support teams were running around the biennial to all the other important artists and other, and they were telling stories about Georg Paul Thoman. <laughs> and they were like, like volcanoes of, of, of rumors erupting everywhere about Georg Paul Thoman. It's stuff that we still don't know what they're telling. It, it, he had sex with the curator from Brazil in the bathroom there, like real, crazy stuff, yeah? And, uh, and suddenly people came back to our little white cube and were saying, oh, I heard the story now about your artwork. That's really great. And we still don't know what story they've heard. So it was like really interesting suddenly having attention and suddenly Georg Paul Thoman having another layer of existing uh, or like different forms of existing in the non-existence. It was really, really fun to, to, to observe. So uh, it was like still nobody knew about monochrome, nobody knew about us, but still Georg Paul Thoman had a really, really interesting time there. Yeah? Uh, what happened was that uh, we had uh, like mailboxes and the mailboxes uh, were usually full of really bad four-colored uh, techno flyers because back then like everyone in Sao Paulo was into techno it seems so they were all inviting us to techno parties and suddenly between all the flyers for techno parties there was a letter in kind of bad English uh, describing a problem that we couldn't really understand 
but it was from a guy from Taiwan. Uh, his name was Chen Chi Chang, and Taiwan was just like round the corner of our, of our white cube, so the, the Taiwan white cube. So we went there and said, hey, we got your, your, your letter. Uh, we don't really understand what's going on. Please explain to us. So what happened was that he told us that he was officially invited as the Taiwanese representative at the Biennial in Sao Paulo. And it was really important for him uh, to be there, a photographer. And he made really, really interesting portraits. Uh, and the, the, the basic notion of the, of, the, of the piece was that he was criticizing uh, uh, asylums, like insane asylums, or like mental institutions in Taiwan, because they really had uh, uh, shitty things going on there. So it was important for him to be there as the Taiwanese representative, because he wanted to kind of like attack Taiwan uh, through his uh, uh, photographs. Uh, and um, what happened was that suddenly, overnight, someone removed the name tag of Taiwan on the outside of his white cube and replaced it with Taipei Fine Arts Museum. So suddenly the country was gone and the Taipei Arts Museum was on the outside of the white cube. In our case, it was Georg Paul Thoman, Austria. In his case, Chen Chi Chang, Taiwan. The Taiwan was gone, Taipei Fine Arts Museum. He had no relation to the Ta Taipei Fine Arts Museum besides that his curator was working for them. And it was really bad for him because it was important for him to be the Taiwanese national representative. In our case, we wanted to avoid national representation. He really needed it. So he was pissed about that. He tried to call the administration. Nobody told him anything. There was a complete blackout of information. Uh, and pretty much like what you heard was like, uh, be happy that you're here, that's it. So we didn't know what to do with that. And you know, like in the art world, solidarity is always uh, like a rare good. Uh, so we tried to find out what happened. And we asked our technical support team guys if they could find out what's going on. We had like this, like it was, and they almost had this like psychogeographic experiment of like running around and trying to find out what happened to Taiwan. And what, 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 what happened to Taiwan is, you can imagine, is like that China had intervened. And I'm not going into the debate about China and Taiwan and all that stuff, but China, the official China, had intervened and had said, like, if Taiwan is here as a national representation, we will cause massive diplomatic trouble. And all the Chinese artists will leave, and you will not like this. So the head of the biennial didn't want to fuck with China, uh, and just like said, like, okay, then we just like remove Taiwan, replace it with the museum, everyone is happy, fine. And of course, People were not happy, especially not Chen Chi Chang. So, and we were thinking, like, what, what, what can we actually do to help that poor guy? You know, like, I mean, he's like right in between this like strange geopolitical problem there, and it manifests on the outside of his fucking white cube. Yeah. So, what did we do? Uh, so, what we did is uh, we went to our white cube, and uh, we uh, removed the T from Austria. It was like, you know, adhesive letters that you could stick on the outside. It was still Austria, nice country, Austria, but we had a T. And then we went to Canada, Canada, Stan Douglas, by the way, Stan Douglas. And we said, Stan Douglas, you don't need three fucking A's, Canada. Give us one of your A's. And we got an A from Canada, so we had an A. Uh, and then we went to Croatia and, and all the other countries. Most of them were chicken shit, and they said, like, no, we don't want to be involved in this, and no, go away, go away, go away. So it took us two days to collect all the letters for Taiwan. And we couldn't get the W because there are no fucking Ws in other countries. So we had the Croatia O, and we cut it in half because we are creative. We had a W. So the whole thing was super campy. I mean, there was this, like, completely wiggly, like, Taiwan on the outside of his white cube. Uh, and but we made Taiwan happen again. And uh, Chen Chi Chang was really, was really, really uh, amused and happy about the situation. Many, many journalists came, took pictures of the whole thing, and uh, he wanted actually to leave because he felt so pissed about the whole situation. Uh, and uh, he said, like, now I actually can stay. I can stay. There's Taiwan, so I'll, I'll, I'll stay at the biennial. And uh, we were really happy about that. And a couple of days later, we were already a little bit on vacation uh, in, in Brazil. We got a fax. It was still the time of the fax. 
And we got a fax of one of the headlines of one of the biggest newspapers from Taiwan, the Taipei Times. And the Taipei Times headline was, Austrian artist Georg Paul Thoman saves Taiwan. <laughs> so a country that should not exist is being saved by a guy who doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, how, 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 how far can postmodernism go? <laughs> and so we were very happy about this, yeah? And uh, I'm, I'm telling you this story because other than a couple of people like you who I tell that story and a couple of people who probably go on Wikipedia and check out uh, uh, the story about uh, Georg Paul Thoman, most people don't know anything about us, they don't know anything about the whole thing, but they probably have read about the whole Taiwan-China incident in some newspapers, uh, and uh, in a certain way also we, we help there. So uh, I think that nowadays in the world of uh, global communication, in the world of Facebook and Twitter, and the world of declining uh, countercultures, uh, I think the only way to really make a difference is to be extremely precise and extremely tactical about what kinds of media you use and what kind of way you use it. You kind of want to avoid doing a piece of art or a piece of political activism uh, that uh, can end up on, uh, on CNN in a five second segment because that's the last thing that you want, want to do. You don't want to be there. You want to be a little bit smarter than the system. And the system is not that smart. It's quite easy to understand how the media system works. It's quite easy to understand how the mechanisms work. And you can create interesting layers and layers and layers of fakes, of fakes, of fakes. You can embed wonderful things uh, into a world that is more and more dependent on what is being told out there. And many, many people, of course, have the power to say, to speak out on Twitter, etc. But most of the time, it's completely useless because nobody wants to listen. So, as I mentioned before, so how can we bring people to listen to something? How can we bring people to, to, an, to an understanding that we need to change something? And of course, you have to use the media system in some way, yeah? But you have to use it at your, on, on a, by your terms. You have to kind of like re evaluate uh, what you can do with it to actually use it in a form that is not immediately like making you a toy of the system. So there, there are many ways to do that. And I mean, in the meantime, I'm 43 years old, so I'm also not the, the youngest guy around there. Uh, there are so many people who grew up with all of that stuff on a completely different level than I did. I think that we have to keep in mind that there are possibilities out there that we probably don't even know yet, and we all have to find them. We have to experiment with it, I guess. There is only one way of trying, and that's trying, yeah? So um, what else can I tell you? Maybe that's a little bit strange to end my talk of like, yeah, try to do good. I don't know, but may maybe, it's, maybe that's the Catholic in me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, uh, kind of like side story, uh, we killed Georg Paul Thoman. So in 2005, uh, we were kind of like fed up with updating his homepage all the time. So we, we created a fake uh, car accident for him in Tyrol, and we kind of like smashed him on a windshield, and he's done. It was also very Freudian, yeah, it's very Freudian, uh, to, to kill our, our, our Uber-Vater, uh, Georg Paul Thoman. But anyhow, yeah, so that was my little story about why I hate counterculture and still cannot get rid of it, maybe, but uh, maybe future generations will probably end art, end counterculture, end everything, but in a meaningful way and of having a better life for all of us and not like 90% of the planet suffering because 10% have more. Yeah, what can I say? Thank you so much. Thank you, CCA, for having me and um, good night. <laughs>